The Americans have widened their operation against rebel forces. The battlefield in Fallujah is shrinking. We went to go check out a vehicle that was stuck in the road, cleared it. On the way back, a daisy chain of IEDs went off, two of them. One took out Sergeant Bonnell. The other one got me at the perfect angle to launch me in the air. I decided a long time ago that I've always wanted to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. It was something that I wanted to do with or without my disabilities. There are about 7.5 billion people who live in this world, and uh, one third of them, it's 2.5 billion, are walking around the streets with poor vision. Sight is arguably our most important sense, an extremely complex process which requires light that can start with photons generated in distant stars millions of light years away and end in the visual cortex of our brains. In the middle of the process, our eyes. Delicate orbs that are formed by transparent and opaque structures, micromuscles, lenses, photoreactive cells, and a vast network of neural fibers that all work in unison to transmit the data carried by photons to our brain. This is a story about how our eyes and our brains work to create the images of the world in our head, and the science, medicine, and technology that keeps them working for us. It also presents the quiet vision crises that are taking place across the globe and their enormous cost to global productivity. From the many forms of age-related blindness in the developed world, to blindness caused by myopic macular degeneration in Asia, and the cloudy visual world created by cataracts across the equatorial regions of the world, no one is exempt. Just growing old is a risk to our sight. Then there are the forms of blindness that are man-made through accidents and war, and the stories of the victims who refuse to surrender to a world of darkness. This is Sight, the story of vision. The eyes, romantically called the windows to the soul, lovers throughout history have held each other's gazes from across a room, speaking volumes without saying words. Scientifically, the eyes are extensions of our brains, designed to capture photons and convert the information they carry into an electric signal that the brain can use. A lot of people think that a good metaphor for the brain is a camera. A camera has a lens that focuses the light that comes from the world. It lands on a sensor which converts that light into electricity and gets stored as digital images. And our brain is, and our eyes are, are much like that in a way. So you have a system of lenses. The first lens is the cornea, where the light penetrates and then it penetrates through the pupil, which actually has a diaphragm that regulates how much uh, light gets into the eye. And that light allows uh, the concentration and focusing of the light to go through the crystalline lens. The crystalline lens is that very peculiar structure in the eye. And if you remember the old uh, magnifying lens that would focus the sunlight on a piece of paper, well, that's exactly what the crystalline lens uh, will do. It will focus the eye back here on the retina. The light has to go through the entire retina. So the retina has to be transparent and then it gets sensed at something called photoreceptors. Our retina has two types of photoreceptors called rods and cones. Rods are sensitive to low levels of light. So actually when we're out at night, if you notice, you don't see color very well in the dark or in very dim light, and that's because the cones don't have enough light to see, and the rods are the ones that are active. Cones, there's actually three types. People call them the short, medium, and long wavelength cones, which very roughly correspond to red, green, and blue colors. Different mixtures of those produce all the different colors that we can see. You have the highest amount of cones in the very central part of your vision, exactly where you're looking. And this allows us to perceive all the rich, colorful information that we get by moving our eyes around and sampling from place to place. We have more rods in the periphery. Uh, and this is the source of a common phenomenon that people can see when they look outside. If you look up uh, in the dark at the starlit sky, you often will see a dim star and then you look at it and you actually think that it goes away. And then you look a little bit away from it and you can see it again. And this is because we don't have rods in our central vision. The photoreceptors, rods and cones, react differently to the photons striking them, but both are critical for our brain to see. 
The photoreceptors contain a chemical that changes conformation, and that change in conformation uh, is what initiates the sensation of seeing. And that signal goes from the photoreceptor, and then that photoreceptor is connected at several different points to a set of cells called bipolar cells. That bipolar cell then is speaking to a retinal ganglion cell as its next communication. But before it goes to the retinal ganglion cell, it also splits off and talks to other bipolar cells, it talks to multiple ganglion cells. There's all this crosstalk happening in the retina, and that's happening to process the information that's being provided to the body by that sensing of light. The function of the retina is to pre-process information, visual information, so that the brain can process it. And the retina pulls information out of it. it. It takes what you need to know, and it ignores all the parts you don't need to know, and it like does data compression, and it converts that into a code, and then sends it up to the brain, and then the brain processes it further. The conversion and encoding of the information carried by the light that strikes the retina is very complicated but the complexity of the process is just beginning. The neurons that transmit the coded electric impulses gather together at the optic disc to form the optic nerve. If we look at the path of the optic nerve from the top down, the fibers leave the optic discs as a single bunch. When the nerve passes through the bony optic canal and reaches the optic chiasm, the fibers divide into right and left visual fields. The right field travels to the left side of the brain, while the left to the right side of the brain. This arrangement provides our brain the ability to see stereoscopically. But seeing by the brain is much more complicated, and this is where the camera analogy breaks down. We have a spot in each of our eyes called the optic disc, where we have no neurons, no photoreceptors. We actually can't see what's there, yet we don't have the perception that there's a black hole in our vision everywhere. That teaches us that really what our brains do is they infer, they make guesses. Another example of the power of the brain's ability to infer what we see is Chris Rader. Chris is an Iraq war veteran that came home with post-traumatic stress disorder that went undiagnosed. When I was in the Marine Corps, I was in 0811, which is field artillery. I was the lead gunner of Gun 4 for Alpha Battery, 1st Battalion, 10th Marines. We went through the initial invasion. I had PTSD when I came back, but it was something that I didn't want to admit to I, that I had. Chris's untreated PTSD eventually had catastrophic effects on him. It was June 7th of 2009. I did a poker run on my motorcycle, and on my race home I did not make it, and I woke up three months later in a hospital. The police report states that Chris hit a car, launching him into the air, barely missing another motorcyclist, to land with his motorcycle on top of him, engulfed in flames. In the accident, I got a traumatic brain injury, or known as TBI. The doctors told my parents I would never walk and talk again. Chris awoke from his coma with damage to his optic nerve of the optic chiasm. I have a brain injury with uh, vision loss from the optic nerve. The optic nerves, one is on your right side and one is on your left, and they cross fields like this. So my right optic nerve is gone, so I've got hemanopsia, which means the whole left field is, is gone. But Chris's condition went undetected because of the brain's ability to infer what it is seeing. There is a condition called neglect. You've lost half of the vision in the left eye, corresponding half in the right eye. And in neglect, not only have you lost the vision, you don't know there is anything there. It's, um, it's a very interesting condition from a research point of view. Very frustrating to rehabilitate because the person you know, may deny that they even have the condition. They retain 20-20 visual acuity. So what could be wrong with the visual system? Chris moved through the Veterans Administration hospital system and eventually ended up at their Western Blind Rehabilitation Center in Menlo Park, California. We had a tendency to walk into the left side of doorways um, or trip over things that were on his left side. I didn't admit I was blind. I would argue that it, you know, it was pointless 
until I walked into a pole, broke my nose. Working with him, uh, he was able to learn to scan to the left, um, bring his good area of vision into uh, play, and walking through doors was no longer a problem. To better comprehend how the brain can be retrained to see, we must understand how the signals from the retina are distributed. I study the cerebral cortex, or the covering of the brain. Uh, which contains neurons that are responsible for all sorts of higher order functions in perception and cognition. Our visual cortex actually makes up more than half of our cerebral cortex. Primates are very visual animals. There's more than 30 different regions of the brain that are responsible for different types of visual processing. These different regions of the brain crosstalk to build the images we see. All of the different regions of the brain are actually communicating very actively with each other all the time. So for instance, if you need to know where an object is to reach out to it or to look at it, you also might be at the same time trying to know which object to select from many. And so you really need to constantly have communication between these different brain regions that are constantly updating and making guesses about what's out there in the world, sensing what's there, and helping inform your actions. The communication in the visual cortex is not limited to data from the eyes. Researchers at the University of Pittsburgh and Fox Center for Vision Restoration are discovering that the brain can see even without a signal from the eyes. We're encouraged by the fact that we can do something called sensory substitution and still give people an experience of the visual world it, that is not true visual perception, but it is an experience of the visual world. In terms of the visual cortical neuroprosthesis, our goal is to be able to use technology that would essentially plug directly into the brain uh, and provide a, a true visual percept. One of these substitution devices is the brain port. The way the device works is that a camera is mounted on a pair of glasses and this camera inputs the visual information and turns it into an electrical stimulus that's on a lollipop that you place on the tongue. We know that when patients uh, are presented with that information on the tongue who are blind, they use their visual pathways in order to process that information. There's some plasticity within the brain that allows the information to be processed in the visual system in people who are blind. Um, and that happens relatively quickly, within days to weeks um, of training with the device. It works much like the children's pin impression toy, but instead of pin, the device delivers electric stimuli to the tongue. We've done testing using the device in an MRI machine to see how the brain lights up when non-seeing persons are using the device. The researchers discovered that the brain uses the same regions in the visual cortex that a sighted person would with their eyes. This phenomenon works not only with the tongue-based brain port, but also a similar auditory-based system. It's the same locations, whether you're looking with the tongue-based device, you know, presenting a video signal to the tongue, or if you're presenting the visual information through an audio signal. The plasticity of the brain gives researchers hope of finding ways to overcome blindness by delivering signals directly to the visual cortex. Blindness, however, occurs in many different ways along the optical and neural pathways. Many of these causes have cures, while others remain elusive. In 2006, the World Health Organization recognized that uncorrected refractive error is the leading cause of visual impairment in the world. So what is refractive error? Eyeballs are not always perfectly shaped. When the eyeball is longer than the focal length of the crystalline lens, then the individual is said to be myopic or nearsighted. And if the eyeball is shorter, then the individual is said to be hyperopic or farsighted. Both conditions cause blur, rendering the individual handicapped from not being able to see clearly, close up or far away. The most important cause of vision impairment is uncorrected refractive error. It prevents children from learning, it prevents adults from working, and it prevents older people from enjoying the quality of their lives. It seems so simple to those of us who have the resources to get a pair of glasses. Many people underestimated the importance of uncorrected refractive error. The World Health Organization measure how your vision is when you present to a clinic. And that has made uncorrected refractive error the leading cause of visual impairment in the world. 
and the second leading cause of blindness in the world. Joseph Fad is a young boy in Mexico who is seeing the world differently thanks to his first pair of glasses. El cielo que antes veía las nubes y me ardía la vista. La cara de tu abuelita se ve diferente ahora con tus lentes. Sí. ¿Qué se ve diferente? ¿Qué ves mejor? Sus lunares y su pelo, su nariz se ve más grande. Y su sonrisa más grande igual. The number of individuals with refractive error is significant. There are 37% of elderly worldwide today that have uncorrected vision. And associated with that are slips, trips, and falls that can cost the medical industry uh, billions and billions of dollars. 30% of children today have uncorrected vision. The statistics are really astounding. There are about 7.5 billion people who live in this world, and uh, one third of them, it's 2.5 billion, are uncorrected and with they have poor vision. And this is huge. This is probably one of the biggest handicaps in the world. And you know, out of the 2.5 billion, we believe that 80% of them, which is about 2.2 billion, live in emerging countries. It affects people economically in a whole variety of ways. For young children, it could affect their educational attainment. For adults in almost every country, it could affect their ability to do work. The cost to global productivity due to uncorrected refractive error is $272 billion per year. Now, in a world where we're talking about trillions of dollars of global productivity, that doesn't sound like a huge number, but for the amount that it would cost to fix the problem, which is only in the tens of billions, would be worth the investment if we could find a way to corral those resources necessary to build up the system. It's much cheaper for our world to actually address the issue of uncorrected refractive error than to leave it as it is. So 1,000 factory workers, 100 of them with the problem, you spend $100 per worker, that's a $10,000 investment. If the factory is producing a million dollars worth of product a year, and you can suddenly add 10% to that, then that's $100,000 return year on year for that investment. We examined about 300 workers. And then because they were very highly unionized and they are paid on productivity, they had excellent productivity records, which we had access to, and that became the baseline. And then we gave them glasses. We went back three months later. We did two assessments. One, we talked to the patients, to their wives, and, and overall, they were absolutely happy with wearing the glasses. The wife was saying the husband is now more productive, he's at home, he's reading papers, he's not running off from the house. There was a better marital harmony happening. And then on the factory side, we looked at the production records there was a 13% jump in productivity for a $10 investment. So subsequently, when the management saw this, they were literally forcing us to look at all the 3,000 employees. So because it's like a no-brainer. The reason vision care is important to employers is it's a benefit, first of all, that's highly valued by their employees. It's, it's, it's a fairly low cost, but high value benefit. You need to be able to see to do your job. You need to be able to see to be a productive member of society. Healthy eyesight is important to having a fulfilling life and being productive at work. The refractive error is not only limited to near or far vision. Some individuals suffer from astigmatism, which is caused by an irregularly shaped cornea, crystalline lens, or a combination of both that produces two focal points on the retina. Individuals that have uncorrected astigmatism have difficulty seeing fine detail because the image they see is blurry whether near or far. Then there is the condition that eventually affects most of us if we're lucky to live long enough. The second major problem the human being has had with vision is called presbyopia. Presbyopia is a major scourge for people. The hardening of the crystalline lens causes presbyopia. Now when we're young, this lens can actually change shape. It's very soft and there's muscles in the eye that can make this lens change shape and by doing that it can change the first focus of the eye so we can see up close when we need to or we can see into the far distance if we need to. The problem is as we get older this lens gets harder so it can no longer change shape. You can tell the age of a person by when they need reading glasses. So if your friend pulls out a pair of reading glasses you know they're 45. 
Press Bay Opia can be a life-changing situation. I've seen people who go out of jobs because they don't have uh, near vision. And then when they go out of job when they're 45 or 50 and they have another 25, 30 productive years ahead of them, it's very sad, which can be simply solved by a pair of reading glasses. Glasses or spectacles are used to correct the refractive errors that an individual may have. Eyeglasses have a rich history in form, in function, in style, and in technology. It started in, we believe, 1286. It probably started from a magnifier on a handle. Some very clever layperson put two of those together and joined the tops of the handles with a rivet, and you were able to hold them and look through them. Now, that person probably wanted to keep it secret, make a profit from it. 20 years later, 1306, Giordano di Rivalta, in a sermon, they talked about eyeglasses, occhiali, brought to the world 20 years earlier. And this really changed a lot of things. And then by the time we have Gutenberg's press and the demand for more ability to read, then the combination of spectacles and printing changed literacy of the world. And we see, even through the 1400s, tens of thousands of pairs of eyeglasses shipped from Venice, shipped from Florence, all around the known world. So eyeglasses have a very rich history, and it started with someone's really good idea. Although we think of glasses as things that we see with, but they have evolved to become a fashion accessory, and therefore, uh, people care almost as much as how they are seen or look with these devices as they are uh, looking through them. We're in an interesting industry because it combines clinical with high fashion. We help people see, but we also help them feel better and look better and feel better about themselves. The fashion component of vision correction is critical. Uh, you are going to wear a pair of glasses and you want to look good in what you're wearing. And so we're really the only part of healthcare that marries that clinical aspect of taking care of your eyes with a high fashion aspect of looking good while you're doing that. The convergence of the medical necessity in eyewear and fashion and trend um, really started to take hold, I would say, back in the mid-1900s with Hollywood actors and actresses using eyewear as their fashion accessory in movies that they were shooting. One of the most popular and well-known scenes is Audrey Hepburn from Breakfast at Tiffany with a classic Wayfair styling. There's probably not a movie today that you can't watch that that doesn't have a popular either optical frame or sunglass that's featured somewhere in the film. That really started a whole trend towards emerging and fusing the medical necessity with the fashion world and bringing that to the consumers today. The old stigma of being called four eyes is no longer a part of mainstream society. It has changed dramatically. Number one, uh, the, I would call them ugly frames that existed at that time have undergone major overhaul. So a lot of uh, design is now in a lot of fashion. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I think today for a lot of sports, it's almost becoming mandatory to wear eyeglasses. If you are in cycling or other sports, where you really like to have some protection for your eyes, be it normal sun lenses or clear lenses or sport lenses or uh, corrective lenses. So the stigma is kind of gone. There are many, many examples now of how acceptable it is to, to need glasses. And we even see young people today buying optical frames um, and not even needing a prescription, but just really wearing them to change the way they're perceived by others. Glasses have developed beyond simply correcting vision. Wearable technology allows the wearer to collect data, whether it's personal biometrics or feedback based on their location or activity. This data can be used to monitor a specific healthcare issue or as a trigger in an early warning system. By utilizing an existing aesthetic of, the, of eyewear, you have the opportunity to, at the same time that you're correcting vision, you're also collecting a health aspect of their data and you're already in the clinical world because you're taking care of vision care, which is part of a health record. So you're crossing all these different boundaries at the same time. Advances in eyewear are not limited to new digital technology. With better understanding of light, science is reducing our health risk brought about by modern technology. 
We've had all these new sources of illumination enter our world, backlit screens on things like our televisions, our computers, our tablets, and our smartphones. The average person is exposing themselves to devices four to six hours a day. Well, that's four to six hours of HEV light that you wouldn't naturally have. We're talking about the wavelength of light between 400 and 500 nanometers. So that encompasses blue, indigo, and violet. The shorter the wavelength of light is, the more energy it has. The more energy it has, the more damage it does to our tissues. So we need to attenuate that. This blue light is also affecting our sleep cycles. We know that digital eye strain has surpassed carpal tunnel syndrome as the biggest complaint in the workplace. We know that sleep disorders and sleep-related disorders are on the rise. We know that there's a whole host of broader health issues that are increasing exponentially that can all be traced back to the disruption of sleep. Eyeglass manufacturers have solutions to block this blue light, much like they do currently for ultraviolet. There's two main approaches to protective lens products right now when it comes to blue light. The first approach is to create a lens coating which will selectively deflect blue light wavelengths off the surface of the lens. The second approach is to infuse the monomer of the lens with a dye or a pigment which will help absorb the blue light as it passes through. This blue light and UV protection in eyewear is much like seat belts in a car. They only work if individuals wear them. There's a heightened level of sensitivity of awareness by consumers today that you don't go outside when the sun is shining without a proper SPF. You certainly don't send your kids to the beach without wearing sunscreen. But it's interesting to note that only 20% of children are protecting their eyes from the harmful uh, glare and rays of the sun. UV damage uh, does a tremendous amount to impact the eyes at a very young age. About 85% of all the damage you do is done before the age of 10. And that exposure to UV can cause cataracts. A cataract is the clouding of the crystalline lens that occurs with age and long-term exposure to UV radiation. Our lens filters out much of the blue light and that's the reason we often develop cataracts as we grow older because the lens has been filtering out a lot, a lot of the bluer, shorter wavelengths. And it's virtually an inevitability of growing older that we're going to develop cataract in some form or another. Worldwide, 20 million individuals are blind due to cataracts. The majority of those individuals live in developing countries. Developing country context, when one person is handicapped, there's at least another person has to give up what they are doing to take care of this person. If somebody can't see at all, or can't see in any way that's effective, say they have two cataracts, then they are not socially contributing, and somebody has to stay home and take care of them. It's usually a girl, so the girl doesn't get to go to school, and so her life is blighted by that absence of education and it cascades through her family because she hasn't had the education and you get a cascading effect from an avoidable issue that we could solve so easily. Well, cataract surgery is the miracle of sight because it takes patients who have slowly lost their visual acuity and uh, it restores vision often without the need for glasses. Cataract surgery is the most commonly performed surgery in the United States. So almost everyone knows somebody else who has had cataract surgery, and virtually every cataract surgery is a good experience. We have the ability now to pick an intraocular lens that will correct refractive errors. So it's a fantastic operation. It's rewarding not only for the patient, but for the doctor, because the patients the next day actually see often perfectly. Taking out a cataract and someone who can't see can turn their life around in 24 hours. A phenomenal 24-hour medical miracle. There are some countries where the backlog of unoperated cataracts is huge because there's no one around to do the operation. One method of overcoming the deficit of surgeons in the developing world is vision brigades that bring qualified ophthalmologists to the countries in need to perform the surgeries. We've been coming down to Honduras for the last 20 years or so, and my goal for the country is just to do what I can to get rid of the backlog of 50,000 people that are cataract blind in this country. The volunteer work that Dr. Kazarski and the other surgeons do in Honduras and in other developing countries is humanitarianism at its very finest. Their efforts, however, are not enough. Developing human resources in every country and area in need because the only way to solve the problem 
is to train the people who do the work in the societies to advantage the people. One organisation is doing just that. Orbis is a non-governmental organization it started in 1982 with the vision to prevent blindness around the world. The whole idea was to uh, mobilize the training resources to the eye care professional in their own countries, with their, within their own hospital, with their own patients. So that's why the DC-10 was being a fully equipped eye hospital, self-contained, state-of-art facility. It is not about bringing uh, some skilled surgeon who can do hundreds or thousands of surgery. It is about giving them the ability to do uh, more surgeries after we leave and being able to train their colleagues in the future. This type of training provides the skill set in each country to deal with ongoing eye health care, whether it is cataract or other causes of blindness. The uh, corneal diseases are quite common. The cornea is that transparent layer in front of the pupil that protects the eye and forms the first lens in the optical system of the eye. The transparent membrane is loaded with nerve fibers and is the most sensitive tissue in the body, being 300 to 600 times the sensitivity of skin. Due to its exposure to the environment, it's susceptible to injury and a variety of diseases. Most of the corneal blindness occurs in the developing world. For instance, bacterial ulcers are 10 times as common in Africa uh, compared to here. We live in relatively clean countries with um, antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals readily available and uh, we don't have uh, that much problems with infections. In the developing world they don't have eye banks, they don't have donor corneas. In addition it is very expensive for eye banks to process because they have to test for HIV and uh, hepatitis and TB and uh, all kinds of diseases and conditions. Most of the time uh, an eye bank will recover the cornea, uh, that's the outer layer of the eye, process it, evaluate it and make sure it's safe for transplant and then we distribute it to a surgeon, an ophthalmologist trained in corneal uh, transplant surgery and they will do the, uh, the transplant procedure. We want to make sure that the, the eye tissue that we provide is safe for transplantation. In some cultures, people feel that they need the eyes to see God, and therefore donor materials are non-existent. When we came and started eye banking, everybody told me, India, eye banking, forget it. Nobody donates eyes. Corneal transplants don't work in Indian eyes. Indian eyes are not suitable for corneal transplants. And today, we are one of the five biggest eye banks in the world and perhaps the second largest corneal transplantation center in the world. Collaborative research between the University of Pittsburgh and the LV Prasad Eye Institute in India are advancing the use of stem cell transplantation to repair damaged corneas. Unfortunately, we don't have as many donor corneal tissues as we would need. So according to one recent estimate of the Eye Bank Association of India, there are around 140,000 cornea blind individuals uh, who are awaiting a corneal transplant. Stem cells are harvested from the patient and cultured for 30 days and then used to promote restoration and healing of the damaged cornea. So we use the patient's own cells and uh, after we have created this defect we use the gel which is basically a biological glue and the stem cells are essentially laden in this gel. So once the stem cells get incorporated into the corneal stroma, um, they start to eat away the scar. So they slowly eat away the scar. The cells, the stem cells that do all the magic are basically from the same patient. So there is no chance that the patient in future can reject these cells. And they have actually simplified the technique from a very complex laboratory oriented technique into a simple in the eye kind of technique, which any ophthalmologist in the world can apply. At the completion of this procedure, a bandage contact lens is placed on the treated eye to keep the gel securely in place. Contacts were originally developed in the late 1800s to protect the cornea from inward turned eyelashes, a condition called trichiasis. During the 20th century, the contact lens evolved to include refractive correction. 45 years ago when contact lenses were 
uh, first commercialized. Um, no one could imagine the availability today uh, for just about anyone, regardless of their refractive error needs. Real advantages for contact lenses are that it doesn't change your natural appearance. The, the vision is clear, it's bright, it's natural. You have a, a natural field of view, and that's especially important in any kind of sports activities or, for example, when, when driving. The most important steps in caring for contact lenses is the, just the proper hygiene of washing hands. It says it was from a contact lens, she just doesn't know when or how it started. It was very fast, two days, and uh, old cornea is tapping out. Contacts are safe and reliable, but proper sanitation habits are required. Contact lens technology is moving forward to be able to do biometric measuring so that diabetics will no longer have to um, prick themselves or even use saliva. They'll be able to determine what their glucose levels are strictly from their contact lens that they're wearing. And contact lenses may have the same technology embedded in them that Google Glass has today using a prism. We have uh, sight recognition. We have telescope possibilities. We have all sorts of things when we put the lens on the eye close to the pupil, nearer to the retina, where we can manipulate the optics and then combine that with spectacles to create systems of interaction between spectacles and contact lenses and vision. So there's a, a massively interesting future in vision correction. Then we have drug delivery possibilities in contact lenses. A drug eluding contact lens could have many uses. In theory, it could be used to deliver drugs to the body. Um, the drugs would leak into the eye from the contact lens and from the eye into the rest of the body. Um, but one of the great advantages is that it would allow you to achieve very high local concentrations of drug in the eye. Currently, we are developing this contact lens for use in glaucoma uh, because there is such a, a pressing need Glaucoma is the third major cause of blindness around the globe. Passed through heredity or when the eye sustains an injury, untreated glaucoma can result in irreversible damage to the optic nerve. It will destroy the optic nerve. It will whittle away at it until you start losing your peripheral field of vision and it uh, narrows down in a tunnel uh, fashion until you finally uh, snuff it out and, and you go blind. What happens in the various forms of glaucoma, as we understand it today, is that a higher than normal pressure presses on the nerve and causes the nerve to slowly die off over time. Normally, your eye produces a fluid in the eye called aqueous humor, which is produced inside the eye and serves in many ways as the blood supply or the oxygen supply to the clear structures of the eye, like your lens and your cornea and that fluid is produced and then drains out of the eye continuously throughout the day. And you run into problems when the natural drain can't keep up with the amount of fluid that is produced, and when that happens, the pressure rises, just like an overflowing uh, bathtub. When we treat glaucoma, we uh, generally try to lower the pressure as much as possible to a range at which that optic nerve is no longer uh, continuing to be damaged. And we can do that by uh, medications, some of which reduce the amount of fluid made in the eye. Other medications enhance the flow of fluid out of the eye. And when those things no longer work, we go in and can do surgery. And generally, the surgeries that we do uh, either fashion a new drain uh, to bypass the dysfunctional one, or we enhance the drain that already exists. If you visited your doctor for an annual or biannual eye exam, you've experienced the device that blows a puff of air into your eye. The device is measuring the pressure of your eyeball, but there is more to the detection and management of glaucoma. But when we're diagnosing glaucoma, we need to look at a lot of things. The first thing we need to look at are what are your risk factors. Now, age is the major risk factor. So glaucoma can affect people of any age, but normally it affects people who are older. So in Australia, with a predominantly Caucasian population, about 3% of the people over the age of 50 have glaucoma. But if we look at people over the age of 80, 10% will have glaucoma. Another very important thing is race. We know that certain ethnic groups are more predisposed to certain types of glaucoma. 
Then we look at your family history, which is critically important because glaucoma is an inheritable disease. Regardless of your family history or race, you should have your eyes checked regularly, not only for glaucoma, but for diseases that affect the retina. I'm a former truck driver. I'm recovering from a detached retina. I had uh, started experiencing flashes and a curtain coming in from the side of my vision. And it progressively got worse until I experienced total blindness in this eye. What happened to Eddie is that the vitreous humor pulled away from and tore his retina. The uh, cavity uh, that we have in the posterior chamber is known as the vitreous humor. Now, the vitreous is a part of the architecture or skeleton of the eye, but it also has the optical properties because it's transparent and allows the light to go through. More frequently, the vitreous will separate from the retina as we get older, and then we start seeing these little uh, floaters in front of our eyes that we follow and they're still there. These floaters are actually the places where the vitreous was adherent to either the optic nerve, the macula, or the retina periphery. In separation, sometimes it'll tear the retina. And if we do get a retinal tear, we are to get a retinal detachment. I went basically nine days before I received medical attention. By that time, the destruction in my eye was quite severe. I've had a total of three surgeries now. Part of the modern treatment of a retinal pathology, if there is a tear, we treat it with the laser to seal it and prevent the detachment. So if you seal the tear with the laser before the retina detaches, that eye will go back to 2020. But if you detach the retina and it's been detached for two, three months, which is typical in these third world countries, when in spite of the fact that you are able to reattach the retina, the visual acuity will be very poor. They have no idea how the recovery will ultimately be. I've asked them several times. They just say there's no way of, of guessing it. There are many conditions that can cause the retina to succumb to damage and failure. So when the light rays come in through the uh, pupil, they focus smack onto the area of the retina known as the macula. And in the center of the macula is the fovea, is the most important structure of the eye. So most of the visual acuity is focused in the macula. Underneath the macula, there's a pink tissue known as the pigment epithelium. And macular degeneration is a degeneration of the pigment epithelium. It's called AMD, or age-related macular degeneration. The important thing to know about macular degeneration is it affects the center of your vision. So when you're looking out with macular degeneration, if you're looking at someone's face, you can't see the most important details, their smile, their nose, their eyes, and you sort of see what's around. It can become very debilitating, and generally macular degeneration affects both eyes. And so you're walking around with just your peripheral vision. In the process of aging, uh, molecules of this degenerative material known as lipofusin accumulate in the pigment epithelium. And this material degrades the quality of the rods and the cones that are overlying. That alone reduces the visual acuity, but it also creates a window uh, through the uh, pigment epithelium for blood vessels to grow into the retina. And these are known as neovascular membranes. These membranes can bleed, and they can produce fluid, and because they are right below the fovea, the vision is greatly diminished. There are two forms of macular degeneration, wet and dry. The dry type is the more common type. There's different types, but geographic atrophy is the predominant type, and that's sort of the cells just go through an aging process and they get worn out. Um, the more devastating type to vision is what's called wet macular degeneration, and that's when there's a break in the membrane or the layer between the retina and the choroid, which is the, um, the blood vessels behind the eye. And if you get a break there, you can get some uh, new blood vessels that grow in, and that's called exudative macular degeneration, when you get either blood or fluid, and that causes a, a very acute, massive drop in vision. Well, I gave up playing cards, because I couldn't see the cards, and I gave up reading. I just really went to all audio books, because I really couldn't read well enough, fast enough, to enjoy it. But each year it got worse. I saw less each year than I saw the year before. Dan was lucky enough to qualify for a unique implant made specifically for macular degeneration. The solution for the uh, patient uh, who has the AMD is 
using the periphery of the retina and bringing the image to places that are not uh, detected by the macular degeneration. Since the periphery is, uh, resolution is not as good as the center, then we have to magnify the image. The telescope is doing this job. Once we're bringing the uh, image to the periphery, the patient can gain uh, all the details. The brain has to accept these differences in, uh, in the scene ability. I now can ski, I can read, I read on the computer easily. I can write letters, I can fill out checks, fill out all kinds of paperwork with this telescope because it makes things very visible. It's amazing. The telescope is a great example of analog technology that is being created to help aid AMD patients. But researchers are hoping to stop the degeneration completely with stem cells. The advanced platform for the retina that we're developing is a layer of stem cells which is put on a synthetic membrane. The advantage of this is that if you just inject cells, we believe, that are not in a sheet, that are not oriented properly, the top side being the top and the bottom side being the bottom, then they don't work as well. So you could put them in, in a layer oriented properly, they'll function much better. And that's the premises of our approach. These stem cells would replace and take on the role of the damaged photoreceptor cells, restoring the patient's vision. Another form of macular degeneration is quickly becoming the leading cause of blindness in Asia. Risk factor for myopic macular degeneration is uh, increasing myopia. And that's because increasing myopia causes a lengthening of the eyeball. And when the eyeball lengthens, the retina is stretched and becomes thin and damaged. And even other parts of the eye are, are affected. High myopia increases the risk of cataract at least three times, the risk of glaucoma, about five times and not only that myopic macular degeneration has been found to be the number one cause of new cases of blindness in Shanghai, China and also a major cause of uh, blindness in Japan. I would say myopia is epidemic in Asia in, in school-age children. More kids have it and the ones who have it have more of it. And if you think of myopia as being ultimately associated with serious comorbidities late in life, so retinal detachment, glaucoma, you're setting up those children who have more severe nearsightedness to be at risk for potentially blinding eye diseases as adults. So what we have done is we've uh, looked at about 9,000 preschool children, children who are six months to six years of age, from four different racial ethnic groups, African Americans, Hispanics, non-Hispanic whites, and Asians. And what we found was that the highest rates of myopia, nearsightedness, were seen in Asians and in African Americans. Causes of myopia are probably both uh, genetic and environmental. It's very clear that nearsighted parents tend to have nearsighted children. But this increase in prevalence in the last few decades points to a strong environmental component. What we found was that the amount of time that kids spent reading, doing homework, watching TV, using a computer, didn't affect their chances of becoming nearsighted at all. But what was influential was how much time they spent outdoors. And what we found was that kids who spent more time outdoors would have a lower chance of becoming nearsighted. Being outside was a good thing. And so I think schools need to um, enforce that, if you will, not have all activities indoors, but outdoors and in open sunlight where they can see things sort of far away so that their eyes can begin to actually change this drive, which occurs when they only look at things up close. Earl Smith at the University of Houston does fundamental research to show that you can slow the progress of myopia by manipulating the shape of the image that falls on the retina or its position. If you take a baby's eye or a baby monkey's eye and you put up a negative lens in front of the eye and it pushes the image behind the retina, the retina will keep growing until it adopts the length where it gets a clear image. And that's called myopia increase associated with creating artificial hyperopia 
or negative image behind the retina. If you put a positive lens up and bring the image in front of the retina, then the eye growth will slow. All of this work around vision by eye care professionals, technologists, researchers and doctors is to prevent blindness. Blindness steals our ability to see the beauty around us, the faces of our loved ones, and shuts off half of our brain's resources. Burns, coronary reattachment, retina separated, the explosion just shredded my cornea out of place. Afterwards, I had a cornea transplant retina reattachment from John Hopkins, which is a top ophthalmologist clinic in the US. You can have a complete intact eyeball, but if the nerves detach from the brain, that's a whole different story. The $20 million question in science is, how do we get the brain to talk to the eye the way it used to? Dr. Sheila Nirenberg of Cornell has started to solve Eddie's $20 million question. She and her team have decoded the signal that the retina sends to the brain and developed a transmitter that generates the code. Well, the way we figured it out was we took um, normal animals and we presented them with many different images and movies and we recorded the responses of the cells. And the, cell, the responses are electrical pulses. So we had images coming in on one side and electrical pulses coming in on the outside. And we just worked out the math to go from input to output so that we could put in completely new images and get the code and, um, and make sure that, that it matches what the true code would, would actually be. The transmitter that generates the code will be paired with a special type of protein that is expressed into the damaged retinal cells. When a person has a retinal degenerative disease, the photoreceptors die and all that circuitry next connected to it starts to die too. So you have the output cells, but you have no way of getting the signals to those output cells because it's all degenerated. So our device is basically jumping over all that damaged area and interacting with the output cells so that they can send the signals to the brain. So then you need some kind of tool to, to interact with those output cells and make them do that job. And so th someone discovered this thing called optogenetics. It's a, a protein that's found in algae and, and fungi. It's a light sensitive protein. You express it into in a cell and if you shine light on it, it'll make it send an electrical pulse. So if we know what the code is, we can send the code in pul light pulses and the cell will respond by sending electrical signals up to the brain. Currently in FDA trials, this system may be the first step in restoring sight to individuals with retinal disease and damage, like Eddie Level and Eddie Silver. It might also allow Rebecca Alexander to see normally again. I have something called Usher syndrome, which means I'm progressively losing both my vision and my hearing. And more specifically, the vision part of my condition is called retinitis pigmentosa, or RP, and it generally affects a larger population than Usher syndrome. So if a normally sighted person can see 180 degrees when looking straight ahead, I have about 10 to 12 degrees of my central most vision. Rebecca has slowly been losing her sight along with her hearing since she was a teenager. I was diagnosed with RP with the vision part of what I have when I was 12 and then further diagnosed with Usher syndrome when I was 19. I'm 36 now and I was told that by the time I was 30 I would be completely blind. Not willing to surrender to the darkness just yet, Rebecca has recently completed a lifelong goal. We're in Tanzania to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, because it's been a goal of mine for a while and uh, I figured that sooner would be better than later uh, given that my vision is not getting better. If someone were to ask the question, if you had to lose either your vision or your hearing, which one would you choose? Despite the fact that I'm losing both, hands down I would say I would rather go deaf. Vision is such a hard thing to navigate the world without. As human beings, our sight will diminish as we age, and we will all face a vision crisis, whether minor or total blindness like Rebecca prepares to face. When that time comes in our lives, technology, science, and medicine will be there to minimize these crises or completely restore our sight. Guided by the humanity of those selfless individuals that have dedicated their lives so that others may see.